Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode four of Vertical Blocks, where today we're really excited to be joined by Chief Lama at Lefi, DeFi Lama and GMI. So, NGMI, thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. We've also got Simone, Chief Marketing Officer here at Phantom, and we're excited to speak all things multi-chain uh, and the future of the metaverse. Let's start with that. So, um, Lama, thanks for joining us today. I think a really good place to start would just be to learn a little bit about what's uh, what's brought you to build DeFi Llama. You know, some of the the most interesting topics that you're interested in in covering and building towards, and we can see where the conversation takes us from there. Uh, sure. So um, the main reason I built DeFi Llama was mostly because I disagreed with some of the metrics of drawbacks at the time. And so I just wanted to build an alternative. Uh, and that's the reason, that, that's the core reason. And since then it's been evolving and now we do much more things than just like tracking TVL. And it's been, it's been going great, but yeah, originally um, that was the core reason I I thought it was important for there to be alternative things that track TBL. Yeah. One of the things uh, that we were discussing right before we hit record here was I asked what I should call you. Should I call you Chief Lama? Should I call you Officer Lama? And you mentioned uh, that your organization isn't quite hierarchical. And, and maybe that's a good way of describing it, that you don't necessarily have titles for the different contributors. So. Let's start there. What's what's your philosophy on building a business, scaling, and um, and the and the different ways that you view your relationships to to other contributors on the team? Yeah. So, um, I I guess it's quite different than the original organization. First, because um, yeah, we don't have any titles, and also um, we don't have managers either. And um, it's everyone on Defalama except one person who is an artist, and um, whose job is to make memes. And everyone else is just a developer and like builds product directly. So we don't have like any managers, any sales people or any marketing people. It's mostly just like, yeah, people just directly building the product. And yeah. And also something that like people usually find interesting is that and everyone is anon inside the Lama. Even within like, I, I don't know, actually know the names or nationalities or gender of the people I work with. I just pay them for Lama Pay and, and they just do work and that's it. Um yeah. But yeah, it's also very like the hierarchy is very flat as well. Personally, um the things I strive the most in organization, well, in like building the file Lama was to build a, an environment that I like for myself and that men um Achieving like high impact, as in like, and the and my goal was to essentially um, have people or optimize or maximize the amount of impact or change that people can achieve with their time. And also something I really wanted to do was avoid um neat things and things that, in my opinion, but are not, like, they're not important. So we also don't have any meetings and we just have like all conversation through Discord. This is the best, um, I think, sales pitch any company could ever give to try to attract employees, but you're not even a company. So uh, that's even better. Uh, I want to ask, you know, I think especially for somebody who maybe is listening to this and they're not DeFi native and they're not crypto native, and they're they're really confused about the sort of anon culture and 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 why somebody would do it. Maybe I'd love to hear your perspective on how you can build relationships while maintaining your anonymity and some of the reasons why somebody would want to do that when they're building in the space. Yeah, so people get like really confused though, like how I can work with other people without knowing their name or their culture or whatever, but I really don't think like you need to know any of that to work with someone. I'm just like, at the end of the day, what matters the most is like, and um, the things that you achieve. So, I mean, my, like, uh, I don't really, like, when I'm working with someone, and um, I mostly just need to like coordinate them or provide them, like coordinate them on like making things. And 
gender or life, only for the things that come with knowing a person, doesn't really matter. And also I realized the whole like, anim culture that's part of crypto, um, you don't focus on that and you just focus on like the things that matter. And it strips away all the um, credentialism and uh, like, oh, I worked previously at that or I, I studied previously at that, which um, don't really matter in my opinion, since I've innovated again, like um, what you can achieve rather than like these famous places you've been at. Well, but then well, other than that, I also like the, the, the idea that um, all these things are just like gender and, and place of birth and all these don't matter either, which is quite nice. Yeah, absolutely. So basically what you're saying is that you're pretty much focused on the output and that's all it matters. So, yeah. yeah, if it's, you know, a 50, I'm just saying 15 year old boy from Cambodia that does it or a 65 year old woman from China, it doesn't really matter as long as, you know, the output is there and yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, that's yeah. I mean, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It also like removes biases um, from people, so it's cool. Also, well, it's, it's just really cool as a whole, just like being an and, and laughing as a llama. Uh, I find it cool. <laughs> it's just fun. Yeah. I was going to ask, is this your first time um, LARPing as a llama on a, on a live video call? I know you don't like to do meetings, but we convinced you to do this one. Uh, I, I did. I think I did like a uh, wire to podcast before where I was also like LARPing as a llama. But yeah, this is the, one of the first ones. Interesting. Well, there was something else in Simone. Maybe maybe you want to dig into it since I know that we had a, when we were in our internal chat the other day, we started talking about this analogy you had given uh, Lama about um, the bazaar versus the cathedral. Simone, I don't know if you had thoughts on that or something you want to ask. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, maybe we can go back on, on, on I guess, my first interaction with uh, with you, Lama, if I remember correctly. I, I think I DM'd you on Twitter. I'm not sure if from my personal account or from the foundation account, because uh, I wanted, you know, Phantom to be added to, to Defy Lama. And your answer was as simple as, you know, just go on GitHub. Uh, do a PR and that's it. So and that's how you guys work and it's it's fantastic and it's pretty much this links back to your uh, recent tweet from the other day that uh, I'm not sure if it was uh, probably was regarding Lama Pay, but it's the same uh, same thing. Basically, you're saying okay, there are other competitors that to be integrated, you know, that they, they you know you have to go through an onboarding process. There's calls, there's emails, and so on. Whereas with us. It's just as simple as, you know, doing a PR request and, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think it's really, that's really important. Also, something with the DeFi Lama that some people find it like a bit, um, like out of the ordinary or crazy, is that we, all, all our APIs and all our data, we provide it, we provide exports for it for free. So something really cool that has come out of that is that People end up building products and from our data or integrating it other places or it just like ends up in a multiple places. And I really like that, that idea of and um, instead of like just building like this huge thing that like and like pouring a bunch of money, well, because we also don't have a bunch of money <laughs> and so we just try to like build a sort of like a structure and like the basics and then like open it as much as possible so people can build things out of it and they can use it and then they can contribute back. And yeah, that's, that's also what open source does. And I think like, like a huge thing that has enabled the file my is this open source just send a PR thing where projects can add themselves. So you're building so much, you have this methodology where you ship quickly, uh, but I've also seen you express on Twitter that maybe the problem is that you have so many things to build, you don't have the bandwidth at the time. And the things you have chosen to build are used by tons of different businesses and protocols across the space. And some are more eccentric than others. So for example, you have this Tubby Cats lending and borrowing platform. 
And so I'd, I'd love to hear what led you to, to build that and, and why is that what you chose to hone in on out of the multitude of things you had on your list? Yeah, so there's definitely, especially I think it happens probably to all of you as well, um, in that crypto scales still in its infancy and there's a lot of things that, especially when you're like building in the space, there's lots of things that you realize, oh, I wish these existed or I have like this need that like is just not met. And that was, for example, me with Mama Pay when it was like, oh, I wish I could just like automate this or I wish I could. And yeah, a lot of things like that. And that happens a lot. And I guess to everyone. And you end up like, well, personally, I end up with a huge list of things that would be nice to build. Um, and, but yeah, of course, um, building is not just like building it, but then you have to like keep improving it, keep iterating on it, and do like some, I guess, like marketing. So you end up not having the bandwidth to do most of them. So what I did was just like post almost all my ideas open source on GitHub. Um, yeah, I don't know, like, um, so to be cuts, it was something that, like, one weekend I was inspired and I wrote the contract, and that was it, really. Nice. <laughs> what is it about Tubby Cat specifically, out of all the collections out there, that inspired you to do it for that one? Well, it was because um, Radmel, Radmel, like, the, the, their founder, asked me to do the the contract for Tavi Tats. And, and I added like this interesting mechanism that was um, batch reveals. So when, when they revealed, there were like, there were 20,000 Tavi Tats. And when they revealed, like, they were claimed through like about two days. So they would keep being like claimed. And, and to avoid the typical like reveal, huge reveal at the end, of everything, I just started like revealing um, the NFTs every 1,000, like every time like 1,000 had been claimed. And um, so I built out and I don't know, I have like, I guess this connection as, because I wrote the contract, I really didn't do anything else. And um, so I just did for them. Yeah, but that, that's it really. Yeah, I've, I've seen you um, speak about how sometimes what people need to do is just build small businesses that target the long tail of a specific need rather than trying to compete to be the number one player or the biggest dog in an already very competitive um, and crowded space. And the analogy you used there, which, we were, which I mentioned earlier, I had talked to Simone about because we found it so interesting, was building the bazaar versus the cathedral. I was wondering if you could go into that and explain a little bit more about what you mean by that. Uh, yeah, so I guess it's, yeah, so it's like in, in crypto, especially like in DeFi, I don't know if it's to justify the, the huge valuations in the space or, or for some other reason, but I, I find it's quite common for Troy takes to be like really overarching as in like um my goal is to be like like to essentially like engulf the whole industry. Um and I think it it also makes sense to just like build like small things um and then just connect these small things with other small things that people build um in order to like achieve the same. And it's also great because um for example, like with Lama Pay, um, instead of like having to build like another system for DCA or whatever, um, our plan is to just like integrate someone else who has done it, and then they can like they, they have all the expertise for doing that, and yeah, all the work. And I don't know. I think that, uh, I think it's great. What I was going to ask you was, 
you have this sort of open source and um, DeFi Llama is a public good type mentality, right? Where um, you're working with Gitcoin grants and we can also go into, you know, your experience uh, scaling that way. But I just wanted to get your thoughts on as there's competition and, uh, and more players move into the space, how do you see this sort of battle playing out between uh, businesses that have a model like yours, where it's very much community driven, contributor driven, open source, uh, maybe um, uh, pushed forward by something like Gitcoin Grants versus other competing business models uh, that maybe have, for example, a recurring subscription fee or uh, have taken on um, heavy valuations early on. Uh, and I, I think essentially what I'm saying, trying to boil my question down to is, how do you view um, this sort of struggle between having to decide to bootstrap your company and um, build small things and gradually connect those small things together versus starting from the other angle of having a lot of liquidity and a lot of capital backing you and then working your way down towards everything else over time? Yeah, so that, that used to worry me a lot. As in, I saw that the Falana had other competitors that had like much more capital that had raised uh, millions or tens of millions and that could like um, essentially file like crazy. And yeah, that was worrying because like at the end of May, um, even if like, like let's say like if I don't know, like maybe like five people working on it, someone else could afford to like hire like 30 people. So even if like they work at like 12, well, they have like the half the amount of output that the uh, P5 Lama contributor has, they would still like um, be able to like implement um, things much faster and do everything much faster than us. And they could essentially outcompete us by, well, just having more resources, right? And being able to like do more marketing, being able to, I don't know, have people just dedicated to marketing or generally like build a better product. Um, so that used to be like a huge worry of me, but um, luckily that doesn't seem to have happened. <laughs> um, I think like a, a big reason for that was um, our open source nature and the ability for like people to contribute and um, especially like projects, and that's huge because. When, when you're building a project, when you're building a different project, you already know how it works and like where the TVL is and how to count TVL. So if you're the one, what, the one writing like code for it to calculate TVL, that's really fast to you. But uh, if it's someone else external that has to do that, they first need to like learn how your protocol works and then later they can implement it. So it like, it takes much longer. It, it goes from, like, let's say, like, half an hour to maybe, like, two days. So the thing is that for all these other competitors and things like that, um, because they don't want to essentially, like, lead their code, or because I guess, like, they're scared of competitive, like, people copying them or whatever, um, they are forced to like develop things and um, flow source and that essentially like gives us like a huge edge by essentially removing a big part of our own mode, which is um, our code um, or API or data and all that. And we also gain a huge edge in that people can directly contribute. That's but yeah, it's 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 a bit backwards because like um when people think about it they're like um well yeah you're like you and we actually literally have uh just below note of our whole database in our website. So that means people can just steal all our data with a single click. And that's like, wait, um aren't you like removing your own mode and making it really easy to essentially like copy you? And the reason is, yeah, uh, we're doing that, but um, we were just taking the bet that um, the benefit or like that this will be better because more people will choose to build on us and we will get like more effects. If we're sure, like, 
were taking a bet on like positive effects of being really open. Yeah, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense also because you guys are so active that, okay, even if I, let's say I, I fork your code completely and then, okay, then it's gonna be my own you know, version of the Falama, but you guys are so efficient. You guys build so fast. You guys add so many features that it would be very hard for me to keep up. It's always going to be a copy unless I just use it as a base and then I, I go on my own. But as you as you correctly pointed out, uh, pretty much nobody has been, of your competitors, has been able to match the pace that you guys are building. Uh, and I guess, you know, the, the the real, I mean, from what I'm getting from this conversation and also from being a Defalama user since forever, pretty much, um, is that, yeah, you guys are so efficient and you build things that people want. You know, that's that's the thing. Everything that you added since the beginning, it was, it, I never found anything in, in Defalama that was like, ah, shit, why did they do that? It's not, you know. It's not useful or it's a, why is it here? It's you guys somehow you nailed it all the time. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> you, I mean, it's it really, you have a, one of the, those very use, uh, one of the very uh, rare cases where really the product uh, speaks for itself. Um, yeah, anyway, I, I just wanted to, to, to say this because I think it's, it's very remarkable also thinking about, you know, bringing it back a little bit to our realm, which is the marketing. It's like, huh, how come, you know, these guys with such a small team, you know, and on and everything, no capital. And, you know, how how do they become this sort of uh, reference in the crypto world, right? Because when I think about uh, data, uh, I mean, there's nonsense that does different things. And then there's you guys that, you know, what you guys are doing is pretty much only you. There are other competitors, but they're not, not, not even close to what you guys are doing. So yeah, going back to marketing in this once again, it's it's uh, I would say one of those rare cases you guys nailed it of such a useful product that people really need and really use every day that they just started talking about it on on Twitter, on Telegram, and on Discord and so on. Yeah, I mean, I mean thanks a lot. <laughs> I think it's particularly interesting that when. When people look at DeFi Llama, or at least when I first started looking at DeFi Llama, and I was trying to figure out like where where is the business model here? It's not totally clear since everything's free, anything can be forked, and the data is freely available to all competitors, which is um, you know something that that of course it's more prevalent in Web three than than in Web Web two across the entire industry. But but still, I was wondering like, isn't this the mode itself? The data that they're producing, um, and over time, I've come to realize that it's. It's essentially like what you're doing is, is this is a continuation of like the Linux battle of I think it was like the 90s with with Gates kind of decrying um, the developers who chose to make things open source um, and, and that war between closed source and open source and proprietary technology versus not. And essentially what you're doing is you're telling anybody that if they want, they can try to come and get it. But good luck, because um, these sorts of compounding effects will be that more people choose to interoperate and uh, I guess compose on top of what you offer rather than try to go head to head and compete against you. And uh, that's really a fascinating business model, which uh, we're going to see more of, I, I suspect. But uh, just like this conversation of us talking, you uh, LARPing as a llama is something I think new to a lot of people, myself included. I think these sorts of models will also become more prevalent uh, as people start to wrap their heads around it. But, you know, at the end of the day, there is still the component of how do you fund your activities? And so that's where I want to go to Gitcoin. And maybe Simone, before uh, Lama jumps into it, you could talk a little bit about uh, our approach to working with Gitcoin and, and some, of, some, some of what Phantom's going to do with Gitcoin. And then um, Lama, once, uh, maybe you can respond to Simone's thoughts with your own experience and, and why you see that the, the quadratic funding model as an ideal way to, to further your efforts. So Simone, if you want to take it off from there. Yeah, I mean, super quick, we announced a few months ago that we were going to uh, move our or actually use Gitcoin as our as the source of the incentives for developers to build on Phantom. Uh, the reason is that we really wanted to remove uh, ourselves, the Phantom Foundation, as much as possible from any sort of decision making process. And we wanted to really democratize uh, 
uh, access to funding uh, to everyone, right? So no matter if it's a you know big team, small team, backed or not backed, unknown or not unknown, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's why we started uh, collaborating with uh, with Gitcoin, and we're almost there. Uh, we so Gitcoin will be uh, deployed on Phantom, I believe, on in Q4 2022. So that's very exciting. It's very exciting news for uh, for all the builders that are uh, waiting for that. And um, and the other thing, I mean, that I guess the Gitcoin allows, of course, we're not talking anymore about those huge incentives that were you know across all the chains that we saw in you know since 2021. Uh, but it's going to be smaller, but hopefully directed to more and more builders to really just give the you know to kickstart whatever they're building, or maybe to support. Uh, you know, while they're they're building, that's why uh, it, it's actually interesting to hear your experience with uh, with G Gitcoin uh, Llama and how you use Gitcoin to to support uh, the file Llama. Yeah, I, th I think it's great, and I will have like a few quips with Gitcoin, but and um, like yeah, they're like kind of like minor things and like things like and. Um, Gitcoin has like has implemented like these sort of like cap to how much you can earn that like we always hit. Um and there's also like for some reason recently they implemented like KYC verification. And if you're a grantee. And so yeah, that, those are like things that I'm not especially fond of. But other than that, I think I think it's a good model. That I mean, like it's it's what's currently funding. Well, the Philemon is mostly like just funded from donations right now. So yeah. If it hadn't been Gitcoin, what uh what other models would you have looked at to to fund your operations? Or or it, I guess you know since you're a builder and what you do is you bring ideas to reality. What do you see as a uh, as as a potential long term solution? Uh, that could even be a competitor, maybe to some extent, uh, in the future, if someone were to build it. Uh, oh, um, I think if did kind of exist, we would still like just receive donations directly and just not have the matching, and it would have been like pretty close, but like without the matching. And um, all the ideas for funding. Like through donations or for something else? Sorry, I didn't catch that last part. Could you repeat that? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, were you asking for all ideas of funding through donations or through something else? Th th I think your uh, voice module is catching that you're saying funding through through what? Mm -hmm. Which part? <laughs> donations, oh, donations. No, donations, donations. <laughs> sorry. Yes, 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 yes. No, I got it now. Um, yeah, I mean, if, you know, if you were to go out there right now and say for anybody else who wants to have this sort of open data, uh, open source business model that DeFi Llama has, and they want to scale without necessarily going out and taking VC funding or taking any sort of private uh, allocation seed rounds, you know, what would be that ideal ideal solution, whether it's donation based or not, um, that you'd that you'd see like in a in a in a perfect future. DeFi protocols working with to to get off the ground. To be honest, um, I don't know. Like, I think this is something that also we need to work on DeFi Lama. And um, I've like thought a lot about about it, and like, I don't really know the the proper so, like the best solution to this. Um, yeah. So there's a business opportunity idea for whoever's listening. Um, <laughs> something something to think about. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you uh, kind of veering topics a little bit about uh, the ENS conversation, right? Um, what is, what, what's kind of your opinion on, on where that's heading and wh where that's going? And maybe even for somebody who's less attuned to what's going on in this space, what does something uh, like, an e like, like owning your own ENS mean to, to a user, especially as we start to uh, kind of form new social bonds, even in an and culture, as we've been discussing, um, where maybe your internet persona and our physical or IRL persona are two separate things. But these are all topics that are loosely interconnected, but I think there's a theme here where what I'm trying to ask is you have some opinions about what ENS is doing and where it's going. 
what are they? The, I really like DNS. It's the idea of making sure you actually own something and no party can run you. Like, for example, Twitter is interesting. However, um, like something that has happened to me and DeFi Lama is that, um, for example, DeFi Lama dot ETH and essentially got like someone registered, someone else registered it. And now they're asking us to pay them. And this sort of squatters on DNS, they're like really common. And I really wish um, we could implement uh, some kind of incentive system to disincentivize this kind of behavior. Because, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think long term it's going to be a problem because it just sucks having to, like, having this sort of ransom situation where someone else has your name and then asks you to pay them just to get your own name. And the thing is that the people that have your name, like the people that have the file on the dot, it literally has no use. It's like, it has no use for them. Like, they're not going to be able to use it for anything because why would they, like, start a business with my same name? Right? It makes no sense. So really, like, the only reason why they have it is to, like, squat on it and then ask me to, like, pay them in order for that. And also the thing that I really especially don't like is that um, people give a lot of, like, I've had, like, two separate occasions where people have sent things to OXNGMI.ETH. And I actually don't know, don't, don't, don't own that um, e ENS. So essentially they're sending money or like NFTs or whatever to someone else. And that's not great also. And so yeah, I wish, um, I would really like if like some mechanism could be implemented to avoid this kind of thing, but... Um, I think right now ENS is quite ossified, so yeah, I don't really have like much hope for it. But it opens the the market for like other other name systems, which is interesting. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting that it, it seems like you know half of your focus is on understanding, perfecting, and mastering uh, DeFi metrics and analytics, and the other half is very much so focused on kind of the idea of social coordination in the like web three digital era uh and you know how we understand ourselves how we relate to each other um especially with all these different elements that are introduced that that didn't exist before when all we had was like a landline at home right to identify each other uh by um but going into that into that sort of DeFi uh, metrics analytics dashboard um simone is even more of a power user of it that, than i am i don't know simone if there's uh, a little bit you'd want to talk about as to like uh, the experience you've had and the things that uh, maybe you've discovered or, or or started thinking about for the first time that you wouldn't have if you hadn't just explored the dashboards. Yeah, no, I mean, nothing particular comes to my mind. I just know that I I just referenced DeFi Lama so much, you know, but also, you know, on podcasts that I've done in the past on interviews and people would ask me specifically about it's like, oh, what are the, I don't know, most popular protocols on Phantom? And of course, I know the generally the first couple, you know, like first three or something like that. But then if they ask me top 10, I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. But let me go real quick on DeFi Lama and I can tell you right away. So that's something that honestly I can only do on, on DeFi Lama. And I'm sure that what I see on DeFi Lama is actually, it's the truth. And uh, what what I really liked, uh, the recent one of the recent additions was the, uh, the yield tracking, and that's something that I, yeah, I, I, I was thinking about it for a very long time, um, for more than a year uh, myself. I was talking to to some friends and to some someone else at Phantom. I was like, oh, it would be cool if there was some platform where you could actually track the yield and see, you know, you know, kind of, you know, without going on on every single website and see how things are, and then you know, eventually you guys did it. So. So that's why I'm really 
I mean, it's great because it really feels that, you know, it's a platform that is built for the people. I know it sounds cliche, but it's it's really it's really what it is. You know, it's and I and probably the the reason for it is because you guys are really it's just you guys. You know, it's just you, Lama, and, and you know your other uh, developers. It's there's nobody else that you have to say. You know, uh, please. You know, if you had investors and they would maybe they could push in a direction or another, or maybe ask you to prioritize certain things over others. Whereas, you know, you really follow the very natural flow. That's why it really feels that whatever you released over time, it, it really feels like the correct piece of the puzzles. Like in, you know, in a almost, uh, yeah, in a chronological order, in a very specific and uh, organized order, so to speak, a logical order. Yeah. What? I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was, I was going to say, um, yeah, it's a platform built by llamas for llamas. Uh, but one of the things that, that Simone mentioned was um, looking at, at, at yield, right? Being able to look at different yields on the platform itself. And the other day, Lama, you said uh, that Medium API and DeFi is still an extremely underused proxy for tracking uh, DeFi bull and bear markets. Um, so I'd like, I'd like for you to expand on that a little bit and, and maybe as a, as a second part to the question, talk a little bit about some of the metrics that you think are interesting or valuable to look at when things aren't euphoric, when the markets are down, uh, and when you know it's, it, when it's a bull market, every chart looks great because everything's green and up and to the right. But when it's a bear market, there's there's more nuance to the things you look at and why you look at them. So um, again, just to reiterate that first part about medium APY, and then secondly, what are some of the other interesting metrics that you think people should be paying attention to in a bear market? Yeah. Okay. So I think I think medium API it wise, it's quite great. As in, because it essentially tracks yield compression across DeFi. So this was the thing like back in the bull market, everyone was talking about, well, you cannot expect to earn the same yields as that you're earning right now. And, and it's going to like compress and all that. And I think that chart like tracks it really well. You can definitely see how you know, like, as we were in the bull market, the median APY was way higher. And like, as we've been progressing, it's, it's been going down. Now it's kind of um, flat. It's been flat for a few months. So that's interesting. And um, there's we have like a lot of like small um, metrics that I think people don't really pay attention to, but which are interesting in DeFi Lama. We also have a language comparison that compares different smart contract languages and um, by how much is e secure by its language and like funny stuff like that. But yeah, something I also think is like um, underused is for example our stable coins and dashboard since it's something that like is really difficult to fake, like stable coins moving from one chain to the other. And something I think that we usually miss when we just like track DeFi KBL is that we're only looking at DeFi, but you know, blockchains are also used for settling transactions, settling vol like volume, moving money and all, all the kind of things. And stable coins are becoming like a huge case for that. And just tracking like where stable coins are moving among chains is very interesting. But yeah, that seems like that that sees very little usage. But anyway, also like going back, like what you Simon mentioned about yields and all that, and then like we saw like natural building. I think something very interesting in DeFi Lama is that by being completely free, and um, we reach the maximum amount of people, and that means that if any of our metrics is wrong then someone is always there telling us that, hey, this is wrong. And I think this is really like part of like what we talked about before is that like having open data also improves the accuracy of your own data because more people can tell you that it's wrong. And yeah, that, that's also one of the things I wanted to get on. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you bring up a very valid point. So let's say it was, uh, you know, th those 
the data was behind the paywall or it was a, you know, whatever it was, you know, subscription or anyway, it was paid for, people would probably take it for granted. It's like, okay, this is actually what it is. And we, they wouldn't necessarily verify. In, in your case, instead, I mean, you have a much larger potential user base that actually some of them, they go in and they check and they, they tell you if, if what they see is correct or not. And that's, you know, linking back again to what you say, just to repeating what you said, is actually it's in, enriching, improving uh, a lot uh, the the platform itself. It's yeah, I mean it's a it's a wonderful wonderful thing to to see unfold. I mean you could I don't know I'm thinking of someone they could probably do a I don't know a case a business study on 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 the Lama from how it works because I the more I think about it it's and it's very unique the way that it's uh. But the whole thing, how it started and how it, uh, you know, became popular and now it's, you know, it keeps going and, and you guys are, you know, you're growing it with extremely useful uh, features for everyone. It'll be the, the first uh, talking llama to ever walk on stage at TED Talks um, to tell the story of it. Um, but, you know, all of this is, is, is bringing me back to something I worked on a couple months ago. I wrote um, a short case study on Llama Pay um, for Phantom protocols that were using Llama Pay. And um, one of the sort of recurring themes was that a lot of these teams had tried to build some sort of version of it in-house to some degree. And uh, turns out that forking things or trying to build them from scratch is a lot harder than simply building on the most solid foundation that already exists, especially when there's such easy open composability and interoperability. Um, and Llama Pay to me is fascinating because it's one of the first clear examples where a lot of the frictions in in sort of the traditional finance uh, payment worlds are eliminated, where um, because there's such uh, a high take percentage fee on even the smallest of transactions, microtransactions aren't something that's necessarily possible with a uh, credit card, right? You can't pay for each piece of popcorn you eat while at the movies with a credit card because there's a huge percentage being taken out from that. But uh, Llama Pay sort of turns that idea on its head and says, no, you can pay per piece of popcorn as you're eating it in real time, and it's going to be half a penny for each one, and you're going to be paying it in real time, and that's going to be reaching the vendor that's selling you the popcorn in real time. And this is obviously a very poetic analogy that I'm giving here, but it's sort of um, materialized the concept in, in, in people's heads. So, um, Lama, maybe you could tell us a bit about what led you to, to build Lama Pay, some of the results you've seen from the experiment, and uh, stories that you've heard from some of these protocols that have adopted it and are using it to pay their employees in real time. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think also something that a lot of people and um, that dismiss Web3 or dismiss and um, like crypto and all that is that. And for example, like Lama Pay is, is something that for us it was it was really extremely easy to build. And it, I think like the team was just like um three people building on it. And it's and we're able to essentially like reach everyone in the world. And whereas if this had been done within like like traditional finance, we would have had to have like um license a license in every country to like provide like financial services or whatever. And that essentially would have like enormously slowed us down by essentially having to, well, first having to have like enough money to like pay a lawyer to get like a license and on each country, like all the legal costs, all the compliance costs and all that. Um, and like we wouldn't have built it if that was the case because we just don't have the resources, we don't have like the time to commit to that. But um, building in DeFi essentially allowed us to just like build something and like put it out there like enable anyone to use that and yeah that, that's great I'm, I'm mentioning it because I, I really like and um, when I see people talking about DeFi and um, it's people usually focus on all the things such as like transparency and and I don't know like efficiency and things like that or like anonymity and or KYC but the specific topic of like just being able to like enable anyone to use something and like being able to build like financial services with like really small game and really small capital and um, is really 
Uh, like no one is, almost nobody is talking about it as a benefit of P5. Which, and I think it's really, really important because it allows things such as like Lama Pay and it allows, um, like good innovation. Not, not, yeah, good innovation. What, what's interesting about this model is that the whole ethos of it seems to be giving people optionality of choice, right? So uh, yeah. I can see this being applied not just to uh, streaming salaries, but something as simple as, for example, watching a TV show. Like maybe there's a TV show that uh, seems really attractive to you, but you don't have a subscription to that particular um, network. And so you have to go and shell out whatever it is, maybe it's an annual subscription or maybe it's even just monthly, but either way, just to get a taste of it, that's what you have to do. Uh, and maybe I'm dreaming here, but I, I can see an implementation where what if you could just start uh, streaming and paying by the second of what you're watching and that way, maybe you binge the whole season and you love it and you've streamed the payment as you've gone, uh, or maybe you're you know 30 minutes into it and you're like, this is, this is horrible and I wish I hadn't done it. And then that's it, you cut off the stream and you move on with your life. But uh, I'm curious if you see this as far-fetched or whether you see um, other potential applications beyond salaries um, being applied uh, or, or having this technology applied to. And I dream of it, but and like at the end of May, uh, I think that like it would be awesome. It would be awesome to be able to do that. But personally, I feel like um, this is like being able to like connect that with real life, like, for example, like, convincing Netflix to use these or complete convincing, like, large real-life retailers to use these. That's really far-fetched. So, and personally, I'm just focusing on just the use case that people use it for, which right now is salaries and vesting. And it generally is something I try to do, just, like, focus and on, like, the need that I see there. But yeah, it would be awesome. You never know. Maybe someday. But yeah, I mean, even just the the use case as it's being applied today, it's it's. I mean, I just highly suggest anybody who hasn't seen it or, or looked into it either read the use case or go check out Llama Pay because it is really phenomenal in the sense that I often, you know, sometimes I think we all get so caught up in these sort of self reflexive games of musical chairs that people start to wonder like, what's the point of all of this? Like, what what are we doing? This is this just a giant casino? And the answer. When you look at something like Llama Pay is no, like this gives you the option to make international payments, salaries, streaming in real time to willing contributors in such a way where you are essentially, you know, bypassing all those barriers that would prevent a small business or an entrepreneur or a contractor to get off the ground. Um, and they don't even need to know anything about DeFi, right? It may just be they set up a MetaMask wallet and they're doing whatever it is for you, uh, freelance graphic design writing, copywriting, marketing, sales, it doesn't matter, like it's applicable. And it's these sorts of applications, these real life, these real life applications that have material impact on people's well being and livelihoods that are exciting to me. So that's why when uh, Simone proposed to me that I look into Llama Pay, I went all in and, uh, and, and, and did the research. And now I'm excited, I think, to see this, the, the adoption of it move beyond just DeFi protocols to seeing all sorts of other businesses who start moving away from the sort of middlemen of traditional finance and using DeFi to pay their employees, regardless of whether their business is in any way tired, uh, tied to crypto or Web3. So um, that's my, my kudos to you for that. And not only that, I mean, for, for those who are not familiar, I mean, money streaming has been talked for a while, right? I remember maybe in 2019 or something like that, the first the first one that I remember, maybe even even before, was uh, Sablier or Sablier. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, that you know created the, the maybe the first money streaming protocol, but you know they got bought out. Never and I never saw anyone uh, build anything on top of it. Then Superfluid came, and again you know maybe a year later or something. Um, but so those technologies were always almost there, but. They were missing the final step. And then, you know, the llamas again, once again, they come in, same thing as they did with uh, DeFi Llama, and they, they just build it. And ooh, there we go. Now we have Llama Pay. Now you can stream money. And uh, anyway, I'm just, I'm a huge uh, fan, as you can tell, <laughs> of both, uh, you know, of course, DeFi Llama, Llama Pay, but because these are, as you, as you said, Llama, I mean, you, you guys are building stuff that people need. 
and then sometimes they're just really in front of everyone and as i said they're almost there i mean these technologies you know without absolutely taking anything away from you guys but they existed before but they were not just you know they were missing that you know okay let's make people use it instead of just keeping it there and making you know beautiful i don't know something something researchers or potential use cases or case studies about it but without the ex execution part without the deliverable um, anyway, so kudos to you again because <laughs> uh, you built something, something great. And honestly, I'm, uh, at this point, I'm looking forward to the third, whatever it's gonna be. You know, <laughs> they probably you're gonna surprise us again. No pressure. We got, wanted... we got something coming like really soon. I, I, I think you'll like it. I, I'm I'm gonna leak like afterwards in DMs. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we're excited for it. Well, I, I wanted to ask you, Lama, since. You know, there's a clearly a vision that you have for for this space. The other day, I was I was um, having a drink with a friend who has been an engineer in Web two for a long time, and I was sort of telling him about what I'm working on, some of the things that excite me, and and he's just starting to dip his toes into into Web three and kind of wrapping his head around it. And he was just saying, I want to understand what are the exciting problems that engineers are resolving in, in terms of making a material difference to the real world. Besides, um, you know, some of these. I think games that outsiders see us playing. Um, so I'd be curious, like if if you were sitting across from somebody who is, uh, you know, an experienced Web two engineer, and you wanted to give them a good solid reason to to move into the Web three space, what would what would your perspective be, or what would you share with that person? I mean, personally, I'm someone that I'm really values. Uh, impact as in like ability to like within my own means which are like not much be able to like um make or like change the world into like how i want it to be and i feel that this like crypto because like it's so early and um, it's like one of the places where you was like a like a person that like maybe doesn't have like too much reputation or connections or capital can make a large and like uh, on sides impact. So I think that would be my my main selling point. And again, like from what I said before, it's it's where I try to like optimize for like the people working on DeFi ladder. And like for example, like personally, I think and um, what we do at DeFi Lama of like and um, being able to essentially like display data for like all the protocols and like and so like also provide the sort of like neutral and open source and transparent like view of like the DeFi market and has like a good impact and I was able to do that without like having like a huge amount of capital or things like that which is what you usually see in like other places like for example if i wanted to i don't know and um, create like a like a build a hotel or like build something like that and um, you usually can't as a single person you need like either like a lot of people or and um, a lot of a lot of capital or things like that or if you want to like build any like in real life <laughs> or i uh, well, yeah and um, you all need all this. And it's also like also happens in Web2 because it's like it's so mature at this point that a lot of like the big companies um, need to well, end up having to start with like lots of capital. And I think Web3 is nice in that, in that area because it allows um, yeah, like things like this to happen. And there's like multiple stories like mine were like, it's like just lone people just start coding on something and like they build something that lots of people use and that leads to chains. Um, which I don't know for me is really important. That that's my main pitch. Yeah, outsize outsize impact essentially, you know, it's almost the choice between being the cog in a very large but very well oiled and, and spinning wheel already or coming in from, from the ground up and uh, having lower barriers to entry to to kind of make your vision a reality and, and attract an audience. So um, I see that as yeah, definitely a, a value proposition for for crypto. 
Um, I wanted to ask, so there's this sort of paradoxical divide between the idea of um, the blockchain is open, transparent, permissionless, and all these other things you've said. And on the other hand, this culture of privacy and anonymity and all these other things you've also discussed. And they both have you know, benefits, which is why they are practiced in, in parallel by, by large swathes of the community. But what would you say the relationship is between those two things, um, the coexistence of the total transparent and the, I don't know if obfuscation is the, is the right word, but the, the right to secrecy or privacy? I think you could like, I mean, it is true. Well, now with like the Tornavacas things, this gets way more complicated, right? And I'll know what's going to happen like long term with all that. But yeah, um, yeah, I'll know. It, it's, it's, it's far like what, what I would have said before is that, um, like this whole view of like uh, like this whole view of like blockchains as being like um always transparent doesn't have to be this way because um they give you the optionality of being able to like either transact and um, like dub yourself and like have everyone be able to see who you are or you can use protocols that allow you to um send you like have financial privacy so just like um they're not a cash. But now, um, yeah, I don't know if we're like the, the sort of like sanctions and the chilling effect that they will have and the sort of like people not wanting to interact with anything private because they're afraid of like retroactive actions like what has happened with, with um, Tornado, right? Where you build something or like you use something that is legal and then afterwards, um, something happens that, like, turns what you did into something illegal. And everyone starts applying, like, rules retroactively. So, yeah, and um, I don't know, I'll know how it's going to move. And if we're going to see a resurgence of things like that, and, or if everyone's just going to move towards, like, everything being, like, us and... Um, yeah, it's like openness possible, like with as little financial privacy as possible. I don't know. Yeah, it is an interesting kind of the, the two can conflict, right? The idea of us being able to to live these sort of parallel uh, realities and identities as llamas, if we so wish, and the idea that um, that maybe everything will be fully transparent and uh, auditable, auditable, which has its pros just as it has its cons. Uh, in a future moving forward like i don't think anybody has the answer or crystal ball to to predict how things are going to evolve um but it certainly especially for a conversation like this seems like a, a really interesting thing to consider um wow we've covered a lot today i don't know simone if there's if there's anything else in there that that you um are dying to ask llama before we well, kind of actually, wrap things up. Very, very last question which is pretty much a curiosity how did you the, the, so you built the Lama. Where did you first mention the Lama? and how did you? How did the first uh, users? How the you know the first batch of people learned uh, about the Lama? So I started like contributing like the Lama when it already existed, and uh, I think like the first like I yeah and. Um, but I think like the first, like the first users was like just from like getting mentioned and like a Discord and like people jumping there. But I took like the Falama from one like it already existed, and but it was like like it didn't have like much users. And I started working on it, and yeah, until like what is right now. But yeah. So it grew pretty organically. This was. I mean, did you ever uh, foresee this becoming what it's become today? Or was it a total surprise that it's grown to the point it has? Mm, not really, I would say. Like, my, my first goal was to just, like, beat DeFi pools. And, and then I did that. And, yeah, like, it just, like, we just kept adding more things. And 
But the very interesting thing that like I didn't predict at all is that like we initially were just like building like a TBL tracker, right? But it's really cool how like by building a TBL tracker, um you essentially like end up we ended up building something that has a lot more uses. So just like for example, building a discovery platform, like people use the file element to see like, oh, what are like some new things or like new protocols that I don't know of. And so like general purpose, like ranking for like DeFi protocols. And there's like people that also use and DeFi Lama to um, like, like farm airdrops and all of these things. Um, and I think it's really interesting. Like this, like, these are things that I did not predict that like this kind of like emergent behavior that came up from yeah, just building the file and then people using it and then like we optimizing for those use cases. It really is a story. I mean, speaking of Netflix, here's a documentary for you. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I was going to ask before we, we wrap it up here, Lama, is there anything else that now that we've got you on the call, you'd like to share with uh, anybody listening? Um, maybe something that's coming up that you're excited about uh, or, or just generally something that the, the, the Llama and Phantom community should be aware of? Well, I have like two updates for like DeFi Llama that I'm like quite pumped about, but um, yeah, I would rather like not leak because I don't, I don't actually know when they're going to happen. So the, I just try to always like under promise and over deliver. So not to like pump too much things before they happen and just like deliver them and yeah, that's it. But yeah, hopefully soon PM. Yeah, my uh, my takeaway from this conversation, Simone, is we don't we don't need to have internal meetings anymore. Um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I've learned. Um, but no, in all seriousness, thanks so much, Lama, for your time. Uh, this was a great conversation. I learned a lot. I hope our listeners uh, will enjoy it as well. Um, where can people find you to to learn more about what you're working on and, and stay up to date with everything DeFi Lama? Oh, just Twitter, OX and DM. Right? That, that's good. Perfect. Um, all right. Well, thanks, everybody, for the time. And uh, until the next one. Thank you. See you later.